So, uh, actually, I'm taking my nine-year-old son uh, to a gaming convention next weekend, and I, I got a little bit confused as to which talk I was presenting. <laughs> <laughs> Apologize. So, uh, everybody here familiar with Angry Birds at all? Yes. Any, no. Most people, no. some people played it? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You don't have to uh, be familiar or, or have played it to uh, get the talk. But, um, so, uh, full confession, um, Part of my uh, motivations for creating this talk were selfish. Um, these are sort of some of the themes that I'm going to cover here are things that have kind of been floating around in my mind um, for a little bit uh, lately. And so I wanted to have the time to kind of organize my thoughts on uh, these subjects. So I figured that committing to doing a talk about it would give me the, and uh, having a deadline would uh, give me the kick in the pants that I needed to do it. So that worked out. Um, and, uh, and usually when I'm connecting with this group and thinking about um, this organization, I kind of tend to think big picture and philosophical because I think fundamentally that's what we are. We're a different philosophy, a different approach to um, healthcare and treating patients. And so I have uh, no conflicts of interest. And uh, as it turns out, I have no interest in conflict either. Angry birds are not for you. That's right. Um, so, <clears throat> um, back when I was a senior medical student, um, I asked one of the prominent Alzheimer's researchers um, at my medical school when he thought we would have a cure for Alzheimer's disease. And um, pretty confidently, he said 10 years. Um, that was back in 2000. Um, and, uh, and I think he was actually being conservative. So, <clears throat> and if we just look at um, sort of the, in my field, which is neurology, some of the major breakthroughs, um, we find something pretty striking. So, um, and I'm talking about discoveries, medications, treatments, um, that represented a significant change, uh, significant uh, breakthrough in treatment and management, and for which there's really no superior alternative that has emerged. Um, so if we look at epilepsy, you know, we have phenobarbital discovered in 1912, um, which is still as good as any drug for management of generalized seizures. Um, Tegretol, likewise, for partial onset seizures. Um, <clears throat> stroke, aspirin is still uh, a gold standard. Um, now that uh, Plavix and Agronox have gone off patent and there are no more drug reps to promote them. Most people are going back to aspirin as, as a um, stroke preventative. Um, Parkinson's, there's still nothing that beats levodopa, which was discovered in 1910 and then started being used in 1961. Um, for myasthenia gravis, we have pyridostigmine or mestinon, um, 1947. Uh, prednisone, 1955. The winner here is uh, sumatriptan for migraine. Um, which was discovered in 1990, or started uh, being used in 1991. Um, and then for Alzheimer's, um, I was clearly lied to. We still have nothing um, that, uh, that makes an, any meaningful impact. Um, diabetic neuropathy, another big one I see. Um, nothing that makes a meaningful impact, particularly in disease progression. Um, and multiple sclerosis, there's nothing that's, um, that, that I think uh, makes any meaningful impact for our patients. Um, <clears throat> so just to put that into context, so if we think 1991 was when we had the last big breakthrough in neurology, um, this is what technology looked like in 1991. Um, and uh, so this, this is a state-of-the-art computer with a 33 megahertz processor, four, four megabytes of RAM, and 211 megabytes hard drive for 7,000 bucks. <laughs> and the device in your pocket is, is 50 times more powerful. Uh, than that. So there's been this huge um, technological explosion in so many other domains, um, yet nothing in the realm of medical treatments. <clears throat> and unless you think I'm picking on neurology, some, of, some other big categories of disease, super high hypertension, thiazides came around in 1958, um, nothing that's clinically superior to those, you have alternatives. Um, for depression, Prozac, 1970. Schizophrenia, Thorazine in 1952, um, for diabetes, insulin uh, discovered in 1912 and used in 1922, metformin started being used in 1957, um, 
heart failure. We have Digitalis in 1775. Um, nothing, no you know, treatments for obesity that are uh, worthwhile. Um, and then there's also the uh, fact that in April of 2003, we sequenced the freaking human genome. Now, that was supposed to revolutionize everything. Um, that has not panned out. Um, so, um, all of this, I think, raises a really important question. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> so what the F is going on, right? <laughs> so why is, this, why is there this incredible gap um, between technological progress in other domains and progress in medical treatments? And why is there this huge gap in our, between our expectation and what our reality has become? <clears throat> so a few hypotheses for why that could be. Um, well, maybe we've just gotten unlucky, right? Maybe uh, we're on the cusp of a big breakthrough, a Cambrian explosion of, uh, tr of treatments. Um, <clears throat> maybe, uh, maybe it's because we have a, a poor system for treatment development, um, that there's corruptions, our incentives are wrong. Um, uh, the drug industry is, is uh, motivated or developing breakthrough drugs is uh, time consuming, expensive, and risky, um, and not good for shareholders. Um, and uh, it's easy just to, to develop copycat drugs um, or manipulate statistics to make something look uh, meaningful. Um, I think that's probably part of the story, but it's not the, uh, it's not the um, primary driver, in my opinion. Um, Number three, maybe it's just brain drain. Maybe all the smart minds uh, are not going into uh, developing treatments and going to Silicon Valley instead. Um, or maybe there's just something fundamentally wrong with the paradigm that, that we're using to um, develop and find new treatments. And uh, I, I'm going to argue for number four. So to do so, I'm going to need to talk about Angry Birds. This is the um, the parable of angry birds. So imagine that there's a, uh, an alien civilization and an iPhone lands on their planet. And um, the only thing it can do is play angry birds. So um, this uh, civilization, they have no um, uh, computers, no information technology, um, but they're curious and intelligent. And uh, they, um, they realize that this is a game. So uh, they decide to hold a contest. Um, because they're also a competitive group of aliens. So they, um, they break into two teams and they say, um, we're gonna meet back in a month and have a, big, have a contest to um, see who, who, uh, who wins at Angry Birds. Um, and so team one um, decides that they're just gonna play it night and day. They're gonna play the game, get as good as they can, you know, the classic uh, training strategy. Um, team two says, uh, no, we're gonna we're gonna outsmart Team One. We're gonna actually take the game apart. We're gonna figure out you know how it works. We're gonna um, find out uh, at the at the most microscopic level what's what's making this game run. And once we know that, we'll kick Team One's butt. So, Team One aliens here, they play the game. Team Two, they're a little nerdier, so they've got the pocket protectors. They're gonna take it apart <laughs> and uh, figure out how it works. So team one figures out you know, how, to, how all the game mechanics, strategy, they figure uh, you, know, you have to pull your slingshot. So if anybody hasn't played it, um, the, 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 uh, the, the object of the game is to knock down the um, structures that the pigs have built, and you're a bird. And you do so by flinging yourself in a slingshot uh, into the building. So you have to learn where the weak points of weakness are in the, in the structures, learn how hard and, uh, to pull back on your slingshot, how to aim it, and so forth. So team one gets really good at doing all this. Team two um, <laughs> figures out that there's this uh, programming language that, uh, that's, that this is running on, and that that language is run through a compiler, and that, that really at the basic level, it's this machine language, this string of ones and zeros, this gajillion uh, you know, numbers long that, that uh, that specifies the state of the transistors at, 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 from, from moment to moment. So um, they're, they're uh, really stoked. They think they've, they've got this because uh, they've cracked the code. You know, they understand um, how the game works. 
Game day arrives, and Team One crushes it. So uh, they uh, they sail through level by level. They set an incredibly uh, great high score, and uh, now it's Team Two's turn. Uh, so my slides are I got a little messed up here, but so Team Two. Uh, they, they try to um, win the game by manipulating the machine language in real time. So they, um, they're trying to alter the strings of ones and zeros uh, to, um, to win the game. And instead of winning, uh, their game just keeps crashing. So um, they, uh, they're um, demolished and humiliated. So the... Um, the, the, the parable here illustrates both the promise and the uh, perils of a reductionist approach uh, to understanding uh, complex systems. So the promise here is that it's, the, it's our, as a species, our um, sort of ability to figure out how stuff works is what's allowed us to develop technologies is really what all of the uh, modern world that we have uh, rests on. So um, we see it as a great thing um, for good reason. Um, the perils of reductionism or with that approach is in believing that um, intervening um, at that reduced level, at the microscopic level, um, is inherently superior. So um, team one played the game Angry Birds at the game level. Um, had no idea how, how the system itself worked, but were able to play the game much better. Um, whereas <coughs> Whereas uh, Team Two understood completely um, how it worked, took it apart, um, but they didn't know how to play the game, um, and so they lost. And um, learned the lesson that uh, if you are going to intervene at the microscopic level in a complex system, um, that it's a dangerous thing to do um, because there are uh, many potential unintended consequences that you um, have trouble um, predicting, and. There's no um, computer scientist alive today that could win Angry Birds uh, by, by uh, manipulating the machine language. There's no computer science that could look at the machine language and have any clue as to what the resulting program would look like. And this is for a system we've built, unlike uh, biological systems, which we didn't, and which are inordinately more complicated. <clears throat> so one of the reasons I think we find ourselves uh, in Western medicine in such a uh, mess is because the current system was designed to treat acute single variable problems. So um, things like uh, scurvy and syphilis and a nail through your foot. So things that have one cause and um, that we can identify and then figure out how to treat. Um, the problem is most modern diseases now are are, are um, chronic multivariate problems. And so um, we've, the landscape of what we are seeing in our clinics has changed dramatically over the past century or so, um, but we've yet to adapt uh, in terms of our uh, paradigm for finding treatments for those uh, diseases. <clears throat> now, functional medicine or integrative medicine, in my mind, is a game level approach um, to health. So it is, um, so another term for a game level would be holistic or systems based, trying to intervene as far upstream as possible rather than trying to um, intervene downstream at the microscopic level. Um, I think one of the issues right now that functional medicine faces is that um, its reputation um, isn't particularly good amongst the broader scientific community. So this is just from Wikipedia's um, entry um, that says it encompasses a number of unproven and disproven methods and treatments, pseudoscientific, centers on unnecessary and expensive testing procedures performed mm -hmm. in the name of holistic healthcare. Holistic's like a bad name. And then proponents of functional medicine oppose established medical knowledge and reject its models. Now this is obviously painting with a really broad brush um, but I can understand where it comes from. Um, there's a, within this field, it's new. There's, um, there's a wide range in terms of you know, practice styles and how people approach it. Um, my first introduction to it um, 
it was like eight or nine years ago, I had a Parkinson's patient, like moderate stage, um, had gone, uh, seen a uh, functional or integrative medicine doctor, um, came back to me, um, whew, off, um, had been taken off of his, all of his uh, dopaminergic therapy, put on a bunch of supplements, and he was frozen with an aspiration pneumonia. And I just, was, I couldn't, I was like, what is this? I didn't, hadn't heard of integrative medicine. Um, and so that's kind of the perception, I think, that's, that's developed around this. Um, and um, even though there's a, pro, there's a wide range of how it's actually implemented. Um, so, but to summarize, you have Western medicine on one hand, conventional medicine, um, which has sort of the right analytical tools that doesn't um, you know, reject uh, the scientific method, but is using the completely wrong paradigm to go about finding treatments. And then you have functional medicine, which at least in some circles has re sort of rejected um, the, the tools of science, um, more so uh, to sort of distinguish themselves as an alternative, I think, to Western medicine, um, but in, in a, you know, throwing the baby out with the bathwater, but which have the right paradigm, right? They're, uh, the fundamentally is about using game level um, approaches to treatment. Um, so, you know, is there is there anybody that you know can can take the best of both worlds and kind of synthesize these two approaches? Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so I think you know we're uniquely positioned because um, you know we're we we um, you know have uh, we, we've all come to a, to the realization that uh, there's something deeply wrong with you know, how, we've, um, been, uh, how we're currently going about treating patients. We understand the value of game level approaches, but we also um, appreciate um, the tools of uh, Western medicine, and particularly evidence-based medicine and um, scientific analysis. So as a group, we think that you know, effective treatment of modern diseases of civilization require game level interventions and that um, downstream interventions of complex and multivariate multi -vari problems are going to be dead on, dead on arrival. Um, I thought Deborah's uh, slide was great with the Alzheimer's, which all, with all the different uh, molecules and intervening. I mean, I was I'm part of dozens of trials that were you know, focused on, on intervening there, and they, are all, they all failed, and, and it's easy to see why. Um, and we believe that the best use of reductionist analytical tools are to understand and refine those game level interventions. Um, and we also think that evolutionary biology provides the, the best framing device for generating game level interventions from first principles. And those represent the starting point, point that, they, that we can then refine through uh, the tools of scientific analysis. So, that's kind of, I see as the future of medicine, a solution to the problems that we face. Um, but uh, between uh, here and there, there are a lot of obstacles in the way and problems to be uh, overcome. Um, first and foremost, I think, is buy-in. Um, I think most um, healthcare providers and most uh, people in general um, still believe that drugs are the answer. and It's only a matter of time till we find the right ones. Um, and I think most people think that uh, that, that most modern diseases are either genetically based or um, inevitable products of aging, and so um, aren't, aren't amenable to, uh, to game level interventions that you can't actually reverse diabetes with diet or lifestyle. Um, and I think it's important um, for us to uh, keep in mind what, as we present our point of view um, that what we're fundamentally argue, arguing for is a shift in paradigm that we're arguing that game level interventions are going to be superior to um, reductionist interventions. And um, that once we start sort of arguing the specifics, we kind of lose sight of, of, the, of the fundamental issue. So, but we, the first step here, I think, is getting buy-in in the basic paradigm, um, which I hopefully the, the Angry Birds analogy is an is uh, easy way to understand it. Um, the, uh, also, another obstacle are the research tools we face. So the randomized clinical trial is set up to um, assess single variable interventions. It's not at all well suited for assessing um, chronic uh, and uh, multivariate uh, interventions. So um, 
we, you know, the expanding landscape of information technology holds a lot of promise in this regard, and I'm, I'm hopeful that um, those tools will expand. Um, we also have to reverse the doctor as guru mentality. So most of my patients still think you go to the doctor to, to get an answer to a problem, um, and uh, in, which is usually a prescription, and you go on your way. We see it um, like Mark's concept of the patient's back, the backyard as the, as the place for care. We're empowering them. We're giving the information and the tools they need uh, to, to be autonomous with their own, uh, with their own care. Um, other obstacles are medical legal risks for those of us who are doing things that are not uh, that are outside of the guidelines and who don't um, now believe those are in the best interest of our patients. Um, another big obstacle are there aren't uh, a lot of practice models for those of us uh, practicing this way. The current system is set up um, for the acute single variable uh, problems, um, and there's a limited infrastructure for people who want to practice in this way. Um, and at least in the short term, um, issues, I think that um, we're going to continue to see demand for the type of, uh, uh, the, with what we offer. Um, I think a lot of people who do offer it, are, you know, have long waiting lists and so forth, and I don't see that going anywhere. Um, I think uh, fundamentally, uh, we'll continue to realize the, uh, the benefits and the, and the truth in this approach. Um, but in the short term, there's going to be a shortage of providers who can actually give that. Um, so figuring out how we can scale what we offer um, until uh, all these other things have gotten into place. So I think there's um, uh, a, a, lot to, a, a lot of problems to be solved, and I think it's a good practice to sort of um, imagine what the practice of the future would look like if it incorporates um, sort of all the things that we think it should. Um, and I think it would look very different than what um, we have today, and that's one of the things um, I think a lot about. I'm going to be exiting from the um, clinical day-to-day -day practice um, in a couple months, and uh, it's partly to pursue, pursue another business venture, but I'm going to continue um, my work in, in this domain as well, and I'm trying to figure out how I can continue to, to um, make an impact and scale my impact, and I've um, realized that the clinical practice setting isn't the best way to do so. Um, so this is something that uh, occupies a lot of my mental space as well. So hopefully in the end we can all win to the high score. That's it. <laughs> Daryl? Yeah, so uh, as you know, I, I come from a software engineering mm -hmm. background. Um, and uh, one of the ways we could probably improve this even further is if there's a problem with the computer system in terms of software, mm -hmm. uh, you would have a reduction to find, like, right, 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 find to where, debug it, right? Yeah, to where the bug is, mm -hmm. and you would fix that, and you would test it that area mm -hmm. specifically. But then you would do a unit test, so pretty much anything in the nearby environment would be tested. Mm -hmm. Then you would test at a system level. Mm -hmm. So any change you make, you always right. sample check. Right. So you test for right, right, um, but then you would also test interoperability as well. So not only would you test the system, but you'd also test all of the interactions mm -hmm. that's between. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so that th this is really kind of yeah a bit of an item. Right. Uh, yeah, that's that's approach. a good point. Yeah, and we um, yeah, that's a lot easier to do. Yeah, yeah, probably, <laughs> uh, yeah for sure. No, yeah. But but no, it's no, it but no, but but it actually speaks to how important it is, right? You're, you're that careful. You don't crash the system when you when you intervene in one spot, yeah, and sure. you have the tools to actually assess that. Whereas we're just like, ah, oh, let's just intervene and see what happens. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And then you, once you make that reductionist intervention, yeah, all of your Bluetooth off testing tends to be where the problem occurs, right? And there's no consideration for of the uh, right the down the other consequences. Yeah. 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 yeah.